Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of our players do, I had as leave the town crier spoke my lines. Nor do not saw the air too much with your hand thus, but use all gently. For in the very torrent, tempest, and, as I may say, the whirlwind of passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Be not too tame, neither, but let your own discretion be your tutor. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action, with this special observance, that you o'erstep not the modesty of nature. For anything so o'erdone is from the purpose of playing, whose end, both at the first and now, was and is to hold, as t'were, the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time his form and pressure. And let those that play your clowns speak no more than is set down for them, for there be of them that will themselves laugh, to set on some quantity of barren spectators to laugh too, though in the meantime some necessary question of the play be then to be considered. That's villainous, and shows a most pitiful ambition in the fool that uses it. Go make you ready. That was Hamlet's advice to the players from Act 3 in Hamlet. Hi, I'm James Evans from Bell Shakespeare, and I'm joined today by three fantastic professional actors, Felix Gentle, David Sonchen, and Eloise Snape from our Players' Company that tour all around Australia performing Shakespeare in venues big and small. Now, today, we've got for you a little acting workshop, a Hamlet lab, if you like, where we're going to really pull apart Shakespeare's language and give you a bit of an insight into how we approach Shakespeare as a company. So, Let's start by talking about this speech that we've just, we've just read. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you trippingly on the tongue. Now, some people say that this could be Shakespeare's own voice coming through Hamlet, complaining about some of the bombastic acting styles that he had seen in his company and in the years leading up to this play being produced in around 1601, 1602. So, the reason I really love this speech is that it's almost like Shakespeare reaching down through the generations and, and bequeathing to us some advice, not just to his own company, but to actors generation after generation. And, and we are now the new generation of actors that can take this advice on board. So I love this. This is uh, personally addressed to us. So if we look at the specific advice he gives, here's the first one. Trippingly on the tongue. What do you think that means? What's that about? Um, I think I think it's interesting the, the alliteration just in that trippingly on the tongue. I feel like that that is actually the sound <laughs> that he's encouraging um, through that statement. But about you know really hitting the consonants. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What else? Um, for me, it sort of um, speaks about the flow of the words that you trip from one word to the next to keep keep the flow of, and the rhythm c continuous rather than breaking it up and, yeah. and halting it. Yeah, so it's about using the consonants, it's about the flow and the rhythm and also I think the clarity, mm. um, but perhaps even more importantly about the pace of the way that Shakespeare should be performed. It shouldn't be ponderous and heavy handed, yeah. it should fly, there should be a lightness of touch to the way that it's performed. Uh, but I think, how, however, uh, there's a caveat with that because I think there's a difference between pace and speed. And we'll, we'll come back to that, I think, a bit later when we look at one of the soliloquies. So certainly fast-paced, but not so quick that we lose any sense of what any of the words mean, I think. Then there is a, there is a difference between, he says, use all gently, so, so he tells us to be gentle, then he says, but be not too tame, neither. So that, that's a very, that seems to be a very tricky opposition. Be gentle, but not too gentle. What do you think that means? Yeah, I think it's approaching the, you're right, the emotional stakes and, and um, suiting the action to the word. You know, if, if the scene requires, you know, intense grief, go with grief. But if it doesn't, don't, don't pull that emotion in. You know, like you don't need to... Um, be sort of overwrought with 
with uh, emotion if it's not necessary. I think the only time that we look really silly or um, uh, overdone when we're doing Shakespeare is when those things are not in alignment, that when gestures are disconnected from thought, when your voice um, is disconnected from your thought as well, and then we sound silly and we sound like we're singing the verse or we're, or we're, right. or we're yeah. shouting it or something or making empty gestures. Um, and I think it's very important that we rise to meet Shakespeare's stakes, mm -hmm. language, yeah. imagery, situations. We actually don't try and pull those down to our little domestic world. We actually rise to meet them. That's absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think something, something interesting is for, for people getting into Shakespeare is that it's not about being over the top. That Shakespeare's language is as large as life. Mm -hmm. um, so there should never be that fear of what I'm saying is, is way too over the top. It's, mm -hmm. The language is beautiful, but it's still, um, it's still real. You know? Yeah, it's still absolutely. very much real. So, in a rehearsal room, I would encourage actors, I would encourage all actors to go as far as you can. You, can, you can't go too far. The rehearsal room is a safe space, as we all yeah. know. There's no audience there yet. You can experiment, you can explore. You can't go too far. So, it's much easier to be able to pull a performance back rather than to have to keep pushing an actor to uh, give more and more. So, and very often actors who think, oh, this is too huge, this is too big, in fact, are being, uh, are being completely, from, what, from an audience point of view, natural, mm -hmm. normal, and uh, perfectly suiting the action to the word, mm -hmm. as Shakespeare puts it. Then, in the third paragraph of this, uh, this is an edited version of the speech we just presented, He's talking about the clowns. Yeah. What, what's that about, Eloise? What do you think? Yeah, I think it's it's saying, <laughs> stay stay on the script I've written. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, it's all right to, to, to be a clown or to be funny, but let's not go a bit crazy with the old um, improvisation. Stick with my words and, and also, you know, stop playing for laughs. Because that's the problem with a true clown is that they'll milk a laugh and they'll make, milk it more because it because it feels good. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, to the, the line to set on some quantity of barren spectators to laugh too, you know, he's making a comment about, I suppose, the, uh, the intellectual level of those that will <laughs> laugh at that class. Yeah. 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 So Shakespeare is telling you, I think, that, that there is a cost to that, even though you, you might you know, enjoy upstaging and getting laughs, there is a cost to letting the story slip by. Let's have a look at a moment from very early in the play, Act One. This is where Hamlet has just returned to Denmark. He's found out that his father has died and that his mother has married his uncle. He's in great distress, he's very upset. And this is the first time that Hamlet is alone with the audience. So, so obviously this is a very famous first line of this soliloquy. David, just read that line for us. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. Okay, good. Now, read it to us with the underlying iambic pulse, the rhythm under the, uh, under the line. Okay. Let's hear what that sounds like. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. Great. Okay, so the iambic rhythm, an iamb is a unit of poetry uh, that has one weak syllable and one strong syllable. So, boom, 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 boom. It's like a heartbeat, yeah. really. And so there's a heartbeat rhythm underlying all of Shakespeare's verse. So give it to us one more time, mm -hmm. and don't overemphasize the, uh, the rhythm, but let's see if we can still hear it underneath. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. Great. Now there's something, there's something not quite right there. At the very beginning of this line, Shakespeare throws that rhythm out of whack. What, what do you, why does he do that? Uh, would it have something to do with the O at the start? Oh, uh, yeah. big emotional, big vowel, big outburst, yeah. Yeah? yeah? So Shakespeare's obviously giving you a clue there, he's giving you a hint as an actor that there is something else going on here, that it's not just a regular, everyday uh, verse line. So what might that sound like? Uh, some sort of exhale of emotion, I guess. Sure, yeah. great. Give it a go. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. Okay, even bigger than that. Even bigger. Yeah. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. Fantastic. And once more, yep. give, give even more length to that O. He's giving you a Stretch big, it. fat O. Give it even more length. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. Great. Keep going, keep going. Thaw and resolve itself into a dew. 
or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Oh, God, God, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Fie on, oh, fie, tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely. Great, David. Okay, now, can you give this to us one more time? And this time I really want you to focus on driving the thought right through the end of the line. Don't, don't ever fall off at the end of the line. Sure. Make sure that we hear those final words melt, okay. dew, really strong. Okay? okay. Off sure. you go. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw and resolve itself into a dew. Or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Oh, God. God, how weary, stale, flat and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Great, David. That, that, now, that is a very interesting line. Weary, stale... Why is Shakespeare... What is he saying there? What does that mean? Weary, stale, flat and unprofitable? Well, I guess he's... He, he's sort of saying the world is bleak. Uh, yeah. But the fact that he's sort of taken the time to give us sort of four different images, if you like. Yeah. Um, and I sort of I even found the sounds of each word were different too. Absolutely. So he doesn't just say, how bleak is this world? Yeah. He chooses four very specific images, doesn't he? So then, then we as actors have to, uh, have to be able to discover each one of those words and find a reason. Why does the actor need to say weary? And then why isn't that enough? Why does he then also need to say stale and flat? Okay? Yeah. Can you just play with that line for mm -hmm. me? Just see how different you can make each one of those yeah. images. Go. Okay. How weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Okay, good. Go one more time, David. Yep. And just, even if you think that it's ridiculous, make them as different as you can okay. from each other. How weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Great, thanks David, that's great. So obviously Shakespeare's verse is so compact, so specific, and one of the challenges I think we have as actors is that sometimes we can treat a speech as sad or joyful or you know, this is the angry speech. And if we paint it with that general emotion, uh, we miss the subtleties and, and all we hear is sound. So I think in order to illustrate that, I'm going to get these other guys in. Now let's do an exercise where we really explore what's going on in Hamlet's mind and how quickly his thoughts are changing. So I want you all to read the speech, but while you're reading it, be on the move, be walking around the room, and every time you get to a punctuation mark, change direction, a comma, full stop, semicolon, whatever, uh, exclamation point, completely change direction, 180 degrees, and then we'll come back and talk about it and see what happens, okay? You do it too. Oh, that is too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw and resolve itself into a dew. Or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon gate self slaughter. Oh, God, God, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Fantastic, great, guys. Come on in, come back in, come back in. Okay, so what, what did that do for you? What, what, what do you think about that? I think it gives a, a real sense of uh, the, the thoughts bombarding uh, Hamlet throughout this speech that, that his mind is racing so quickly, jumping from one image to the next, uh, that he almost can't keep up with them. He, he, he almost can't finish one thought before a new one has entered his mind. Mm. Yeah. Even physically, like um, you can feel your own you know, heart racing and, and as each you know, um, thought change is coming on, on the punctuation point, it's, um, it's sort of... I started to feel stressed as as they started to become faster. So I think it yeah. almost gives it gives you a clue into his his emotional state yeah. as well. Yeah, it really yeah. informs you after where where you need to be stakes wise. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Now, of course, we don't know um, how Shakespeare punctuated his, uh, his. I mean, this is just an editor's version of the punctuation. We don't know. But this is just an exercise uh, to help understand how quickly Hamlet's thought process is moving. How quickly his thoughts springboard from one to the next. So, can you give us a version, Felix, give us a version, uh, Eloise and David, come over here for a sec. Felix, give us a version where you're really 
pondering the thoughts and giving us like big gaps and big pauses between each thought. Sure. Give us that version. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. Thor. And resolve itself into a dew. Or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self slaughter. Oh God. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> okay, that, that's uh, that, that's taken quite a while. Uh, come on, guys. Um, so, so what I think about that is that it seems like, even though it seems more thoughtful and measured, we're losing track of yeah, what's going on with, with, with these big holes in the middle of the acting. And this is another trap that um, actors can fall into: is big gaps between the thoughts. Uh, whereas I think what Shakespeare wants us to do with the trippingly on the tongue direction is to close those gaps, think on the line, and actually drive the thoughts, mm. bouncing them one on top of the other. Eloise, give us a different version this right. time. <laughs> yeah, where, where we just, just slam straight through all the punctuation, don't pay attention to anything at all, okay. and just skip right through all the words really, really quickly. Let's see what that does. Okay. <clears throat> Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt Thor and resolve itself into a Jew, or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Oh, God, God, how weary stout. Okay, stop, 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 stop. Okay, great. So, we can see, we can start to see somewhere in the middle of those two where the balance might be. Paying attention to every single word, making sure every word has its weight, but not overdoing it with the ponderous pausing. I think that's what I mean uh, by the difference between pace and speed that the thoughts are all very clear and sharp, but not, not pondered and not raced through and, uh, and completely missed. Because in both of those versions, I really didn't understand what you were saying at all. Okay, great. Let's try something where we emphasize the last word of each line. I think very often in Shakespeare, he puts a lot of weight and emphasis on that final word. And very often as actors, we kind of skate off that word or drop it off and we don't give it the weight that it deserves. So let's do this speech, just split it up amongst you, just giving us the final word of each line. Off you go. Melt. Dew. Fixed. God. Unprofitable. World. Garden. Nature. This. Two. This. Mother. Heaven. Earth. Him. Grown. Month. Woman. Old. Body. She. Reason. Uncle. Father. Month. Tears. Eyes. Post. Sheets. Good tongue. Great. Post, sheets, good tongue. I think, <laughs> I, I think that's wonderful. I think the story of the speech is really told through emphasising those last words. And very often, uh, as actors, we can tend to die off at the end of a line or drop the last word of a line. Like, oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. Uh, Whereas, in fact, I think what Shakespeare wants us to do is make sure that we are hitting that final word as strongly as any other word in the line, perhaps even more strongly. Uh, I also find it really interesting that it takes him over 20 lines to get to the point of this speech. And that's another clue for the actor, that there's so many parenthetical statements and wrong turns and U-turns and backups until finally he tells us, married with my uncle. That's where he's heading to, that's where he's driving to. But it's almost like he's trying to hold the thoughts out or, or shut them out and not see that image in his head that he can't help it. Eventually he does. So there are lots of clues for the actor within Shakespeare's verse itself. And in the next scene we look at, uh, let's explore a few more of those as well. Okay. Let's look at a scene from a bit later in the play now. It's sometimes called the closet scene. It's between Hamlet and his mum. So Hamlet's just passed up the opportunity to murder Claudius in the chapel. And now he's come to confront his mother in her room. So guys, uh, David and Eloise, could you just read these first four lines of the scene, just so we can hear it and hear what Shakespeare's doing with the language. Hamlet, thou hast thy father much offended. Mother, you have my father much offended. Come, come, you answer with an idle tongue. Go, go, you question with a wicked tongue. Okay, so obviously Shakespeare is making Hamlet reflect the style and the structure and the words that Gertrude is using and Hamlet's throwing them back in Gertrude's face. It sounds quite formal because, because it's so repeated. Mm. But, but what else do we get out of that kind of structure? Why would Shakespeare make Hamlet mirror the way Gertrude's speaking? 
kind of kind of shows Hamlet's wit mm -hmm. for starters. Um, he's very clever with his wordplay. I find. Yep. Um, with all that use of antithesis, thing like that, and I think that sort of gets to Gertrude. I think he knows that as well. Yeah. I don't know what do you find with? I think it, it informs. Um, you know, we find out about the history of their relationship. You know, Hamlet's obviously aware of how to get under his mother's skin, so then we get an idea of, of maybe previous arguments or banter that they've had before as sure. well. Sure, yeah. yeah. And it really gives a sense of pace, doesn't it? Yeah. If, yeah. if the, uh, the structure is repeated like that, I think. Okay, now what we're going to look at is a couple of different interpretations of this scene, because of course there is not just one way of doing it. So, so let's chuck a couple of interpretations at you just sure. to see, see how you go. Okay, in this first version, let's have you, David, as Hamlet being kind of a surly, whiny teenager. Okay. And uh, Gertrude, you can be quite a tough, combative mum. Okay, okay. Let's, yeah. let's see how that version plays out. Okay. All right. Now, Mother, what's the matter? Hamlet, thou hast thy father much offended. Oh, Mother, you have my father much offended. Oh, come, come, you oh. answer with an idle tongue. Go, go, you question with a wicked tongue. Why, how now, Hamlet? What's the matter now? Have you forgot me? No. Okay, fantastic, very good. Now, let's, let's do a completely different version altogether. David, step out for a sec. Felix, come on in. New Hamlet, hey. same Gertrude. Okay, this time, Hamlet. Yeah. Turn up the stakes on the uh, aggression of sure. Hamlet, make him quite tough. And, uh, and Gertrude, this time, how about a version where she's quite loving and nurturing okay. and understanding of Hamlet's problems? Okay. okay. Let's go. <clears throat> now, Mother, what's the matter? Hamlet, thou hast thy father much offended. Well, mother, you have my father much come, offended. Come, come, you answer with an idle tongue. Go, go, you question with a wicked tongue. Why, how now, Hamlet? What's the matter now? Have you forgot me? Ooh, okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let's step up, Felix. If that's. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> oh, Gertrude, I felt really sorry for you. Okay, let's just do one more version. Mm -hmm. uh, David, come back in. Now, this time, can you be quite um, playful and teasing as okay. Hamlet, perhaps, even with yeah. Gertrude? And Gertrude, a bit more passive aggressive this time, okay. a bit more cold, shut him out, make him feel guilty. Yeah, okay. okay, okay. Off you go. <clears throat> now, mother, what's the matter? Hamlet, thou hast thy father much offended. Well, mother, you have my father much offended. Come, come, you answer with an idle tongue. Go, go, you question with a wicked tongue. Why, how now, Hamlet? What's the matter now? Have you forgot me? No. Okay, terrific, that was great. Felix, come back in. So, obviously, not one of those interpretations is correct or more correct than any others. Well, what do you make of all these different interpretations? What's the point? I, th I think it's. Um, I think you, you find that in each interpretation, some moments work and, and really help inform the character, um, and others don't so much. Sure. So I think it's about you know, you know, finding a three-dimensional character that, yeah. that takes all of those elements. Yeah. You know. I yeah. also found uh, sort of the opposite interpretations to what you expect mm. on, the, on, on the page sometimes works a little bit more interesting as well, mm. uh, especially like the playful one at the end. There, there are some moments where you could play that aggressive, um, but then sort of flipping it over and all of a sudden you've got to yeah, switch it up to dynamic. playful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, terrific. Let's go one more time then, mm -hmm. uh, and Felix, this time uh, you step in. I'm not going to give you a particular interpretation on this. Just see how the scene plays out, and then halfway through we'll switch over and bring in David and see what it's like when two different actors play the role. Okay? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> now, Mother, what's the matter? Hamlet, thou hast thy father much offended. Mother, you have my father much offended. Come, come, you answer with an idle tongue. Go, go, you question with a wicked tongue. Why, how now, Hamlet? What's the matter have now? Have you forgot me? No, by the rude, not so. You are the queen your husband's brother's wife. And would it were not so, you are my mother. Okay, great. And now step out and David, come in. Pick it up from Have You Forgot Me? Have you forgot me? No, by the rude, not so. You are the queen, your husband's brother's wife. And would it were not so, you are my mother. Nay, then I'll set those to you that can speak. Come, come and sit you down. You shall not budge. You go not till I set you up a glass where you may see the inmost part of you. What wilt thou do? Thou wilt not murder me. 
help. <laughs> oh. Okay, good, good. Okay, now that's, that's really interesting because, no, look at that. Shakespeare's given you this stage direction in the language. There, there are very few stage directions in Shakespeare. Yeah. Uh, but there are lots of stage direction within the dialogue itself. So Gertrude's here saying, <laughs> thou wilt not murder me, help, help, ho. Well, obviously there's something, go yeah. there's something serious going on there. <laughs> Uh, for her to yell out help and uh, talk about murder. Yeah. So, so let's just go back to, to <laughs> Have You Forgotten Me and just David and Eloise, both of you, put a bit more pressure on each other. Okay. Don't, don't make the other actor generate the, you know, the emotion or the yeah. feeling. Play the action on the other character, force them uh, to, to come back at you with something and see what happens. Okay. okay. Uh, from Have You Forgotten Me? Yeah. <clears throat> Have you forgot me? No, by the rude, not so. You are the queen, your husband's brother's wife, and would it were not so, you are my mother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Set those to you that can I speak up! Come, sit uh, you down, you shall not budge. You go not till I set you up a glass where you may see the inmost part of you. What do you now do? That would not matter me. Help! Help! Home! Okay, good, good. I'll stop you there before we get any more serious. Felix, <laughs> Felix come back in. Come back in. Uh, great, okay, so obviously today what we're doing is the beginning of an exploration of issues relating to playing characters, using the text, finding the clues and the hidden stage directions in the language as well. But what's really interesting to me there is even just swapping out one actor for another can bring in an entirely different interpretation. Mm. So every actor, especially with Hamlet, brings their own self their own heart, their own feelings, their own interpretation, their own experience and history into the role. I find that really, really interesting. So no matter what your take is on Hamlet or Gertrude or Ophelia or any of the other characters in any other Shakespeare play, it's important to know that all of the clues that you need are in the text in front of you. So whether it's a clue about the character's state of mind, st emotional state, where they're going, what they're doing, how they feel about someone else, physically where they are in the space, everything can be found right there in the text. And so as actors, our job is to almost be like detectives and mine the text for those clues. And I know that Shakespeare's verse can sometimes be quite daunting, it sometimes feels like a really high wall to climb, but in fact, it's a really, really comforting handbook of clues. So get your Shakespeare texts out, have a go, as Hamlet says, go make you ready. <laughs>